All righty, buddy. So we have Andrea Valdez with us today of 3D Muscle Journey. Welcome, Andrea. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And uh, for today's charity, my donation is going towards, I want to make sure I got this right, the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the ASPCA. Yes. So why did we choose that one? Uh, I have a thing for animals, and they can't talk to help themselves. So that is it. I have nothing against all the other charities. I've heard a lot of the episodes and uh, what other people have donated to, and I think it's all great. Uh, I know Brad just did St. Jude's, and it was a close tie, but I went with animals because, uh, you know, they can't speak for themselves. They need other people to do it for them, to save them. So, um, and then relevant to just now, the fires in California, I've been seeing a lot of really sad stuff about how people evacuate, but the poor little animals are left behind, and it's so sad. The stranded giraffes we talked about. There is a stranded giraffe in behind Northern you. California. <laughs> oh, there's that one, too, behind me. I was talking yeah. giraffe on my wall. Uh, yeah, but that's it. And, like, I grew up, uh, God, we had so many pets. But my mom used to show dogs, and I think that's where it all started. Oh, I grew really? up with, like, tons of fur brothers and sisters, <laughs> and it kind of never went away. So I have a, a place in my heart for them. Okay, cool, cool. So, so um, 3MJ is, is very popular at this point, and you are the newest member. So, yeah. you know, how did, well, first, your background, I know you had a gymnastics background. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get into serious lifting, and then how did you eventually meet the rest of the team? Okay. I'm going to try to be short, but this might go long with it. Feel free to rant. Okay, cool. Uh, and stop me whenever. Uh, so, serious lifting. Okay, so I started serious training of some sort when I was like six, like you said, in gymnastics. So I competed in gymnastics uh, for a really long time growing up. I uh, started training a lot of hours a day at a very young age. So that was never weird to me. I, I, I did that um, through middle school, which like I was like 14 when I quit and I've been competing for six, seven years at that point, um, which is pretty standard for, for female gymnasts. Their peak is pretty young. And then I did cheerleading, but not just for the school. I did competitive cheer, which is a thing, if y'all don't know that. And it is pretty intense. Not as not as crazy as gymnastics, but so I competed in cheer, um, God, till I was 26, off and on. Like, I, I coached wow. gymnastics, but I uh, they have adult, like, cheer squads. And then when I, I cheered for my undergrad uh, for the school, and then when I was in grad school, even at OU, getting my master's in exercise physiology, there was a uh, all-star gym in Oklahoma City that I would drive to go to practice a couple times a week. And so I still competed wow. yeah, for a long time. Uh, and then somewhere towards the end of that, like I was 24, 25, 26 in grad school at a, you know, I always obviously liked flipping around and playing, right? It was always for, for skills for teams, for performance-based sports. I didn't really, and then like uh, in gymnastics, you have a lot of conditioning. So I did a lot of stuff that, you know, of the four hours a day of practice, one of those hours was always just conditioning. So it would look like body weight strength stuff. But again, mm -hmm. I didn't think anything of it. Right. Um, then when I, I decided that I, you know, I coached, like I said, I coached gymnastics all through high school and undergrad. And I, at that time, thought that I wanted to coach forever. Like, I thought I wanted to open my own gymnastics training center, this and that. So um, I majored in sports management and business administration, but with a that was under the whole exercise physiology or exercise right. science kind of thing. Um, and then I managed the gymnastics place that I coached at, and I realized, oh, I don't really want to do this. Um, so then I thought I wanted – Rather than coaching, I was like, I'm going to teach. So I thought I wanted to be a professor in exercise mm -hmm. physiology. And that's why I went to OU, the University of Oklahoma, to pursue that. And when you're a grad student there, you have to teach at the same time. And it was like activity classes. So you're assigned certain sports. Like you could teach yoga. You could teach, and I had to teach like individual fitness. Mm. So um, just kind of teaching undergrad kids who really don't care how to be sort of healthy. Right. <laughs> so, um, so I was in there a lot, and, and there was a, a couple of the guys that were my, I guess, other students with me that were teaching weightlifting the class. And those are kind of the guys that started me, like, lifting weights, like, in the gym, like, actually getting a barbell and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and mind you, I picked up like other humans with cheerleading. I was a base or whatever. I could lift stuff, but I hadn't lifted like barbells. 
And so that was, I you know up until that point it had been boot camps and spin and then cheer. So just uh, activity and exercising, but not for a purpose. And I saw pretty quickly um, my body would change a little bit. Like I wasn't losing crazy weight. I was still having fun, but I was like, like I would see like a little bit of shoulders and I could, mm-hmm. um, when I walked, I could see like quads instead of just leg. And so I got real excited about that. Um, and at the same time, like I'm learning more and more about the human body and hypertrophy or whatever in my studies and um, working in the lab too. We, you know, we were right across the hall from, like I was in the biophysics lab. So it was very basic, not so much applied, but across the hall, we had the metabolic like lab and it was like all these VO2 max testing and a lot of, and we did some lifting, but it was just like seeing, um, learning more while also seeing my body change and it just piqued my interest a lot. So I was like 24, 25. Sure. Uh, and then one of the PhD students while I was there was actually coached by Lee Norton. Um, oh, so I got yeah. to see this guy that I saw every day who was a huge dude named Chris Voss. He's a professor now. Um, but I saw him, you know, I knew him for a few months and he was just this big, strong dude. And then like, I didn't see him every day, but maybe once or twice a week. And then one day I'd look up and I'm like, his face is real different, you know? And, you know, he he was going through a prep at the time and his whole mm. face and body was changing. And he actually was in one of our studies in our lab. Okay. And it was like, uh, he had to do leg extensions on an isokinetic dynamometer, which is like, basically, I, so I, I got to pull his shorts up and see his quad and in, in like, he was a professional bodybuilder at this time. And I was like, Oh my God, you know, like all, right. all the separation. I just, I'd never seen that before. So I start lifting and I'm around the student and he, uh, he told me, you know, what he was doing and his coach was Lane Norton. And I like Google Lane Norton and what's this about? And so oh, just, you didn't know him yet. No, I didn't know anything about bodybuilding. Um, yeah. Until like, not, not the sport of bodybuilding. Like I said, I'd gotten into lifting a little and I was right. like, and then it was like changing your body kind of stuff that I got like super nerded out into. So I stupidly, <laughs> like I said, I just started like seriously lifting a few months maybe. And I was like, Chris, I want to do this. And so um, it was me. And then another, prof- like, I don't know if you know who Jeremy Linick is, but he's like the yeah. guy that went to his BFR. So he was in the lab too. So it was like Jeremy, Chris, and then Chris's now wife, Lynn, Lindy. Um. I got, got them in a room and I was like, I want y'all to help me do this. When's the next competition? I want to go. And they're yeah. like, I don't think you should. The next one's in like 10 weeks. But next season, I was like, I'll do it in 10 weeks. And so that was my first prep. It was a disaster. Oh, wow. I was like 30 pounds. <laughs> and I looked skinny. Um, wow. What was I your starting about? ending weight? Uh, I think the lightest I got was like one, Somewhere like 111, 114, something like that. Wow. And when I started, I was like 140, I think. Yeah. And You're that's because awesome. I think I went from like 150 to 140, just like I'd started learning to count macros based on like Lane's article about mine. Yeah, yeah. So in total, it was like a lot of weight, not a lot of time. But And I you were like 5'2". 5'2", five, five two. Five two? okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm a midget, so don't get offended. No, I'm a short person. <laughs> um, shorter than most would think, so yeah. That's how it started. Uh, that was so. Part. Yeah, well, I was just gonna say. I mean, you know, people have varied opinions of Lane Norton, but I mean, one thing you have to give him is he he really started a lot of this whole yeah. you know world that we're in now with as far as you know the online coaching and all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, because you know you kind of got into I guess indirectly through him and in a way you knew somebody through him. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Eric knew him on bodybuilding.com, mm-hmm. and I actually mm-hmm. talked with lane a little bit on bodybuilding.com way back on the forums um i didn't know or at least i don't think i knew um eric back then but uh, you know we all got into it around the same time but i think uh lane kind of pioneered it for everybody to some degree yeah by the time like i never did the forum stuff Mm -hmm. uh but by the time i was like doing because it was 2011 when i got end of 2011 oh is that right yeah uh but that year or whatever like I remember it like was so crazy because Chris, the guy, the PhD student uh, with me that was prepping then that was under Lane or whatever, he told me about him, right? And I looked it up on bodybuilding.com and it was the, um, they had the Team Norton like video series and Chris was on it and I was like, like mind blown that my oh, friend wait, was like on the when, internet. When Lane was prepping, like his. They he had, had like, like a... four or five or six athletes that they were like profiling through their season. 
Yeah. He, I, I'm remembering because I, I watched some of the series. There was one guy. What was the guy's name? You said Chris. He's Chris Foss. F A H S. Did he have like? I, I don't know. This is weird. Weird. I remember this guy. He talked about eating peanut butter, and he ate like. Lane was trying to tell one of his friends to eat more, and the guy was lean year round. It was only like eating two thousand calories or something all year. I don't think so because Chris no. was big. Like he powerlifted before. Okay, probably not. He then. was very tall and very strong, and very very jacked. So I don't know. I don't. I don't see him living on two thousand calories. Yeah, so maybe not him, but. But it was like, uh, real, I was like real starstruck by the guy that I like saw every day. <laughs> was like, saw right, him. right. And and then it was like, uh, he had he was working with Ava Cowan, and she was like goals. Like when mm. I saw her, I was like, oh my god. Um, and so that's where it kind of went. And then yeah. how did you meet 3DMJ and get brought on? Oh, okay, okay, okay. So then, uh. Yeah, so I lost a lot of weight, was a hermit now, lost all my friends, like all that whole, the usual. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, the usual, I know what I'm doing, but I don't do anything. Um, and so I, I graduated or whatever. So in that time, too, I realized I don't want to be a professor. Um, so I got my master's or whatever. And by between that time, right, like it was my first season ever was like the first year uh, that I was in grad school. And then I during my second year, I was like, I don't want to work in academia. Um, I'm not sure what I want to do, but I know I want to keep like athletically, like even though I was in grad school and even though like I was doing my thesis, my brain was really all in bodybuilding. Like I just, I was obsessed, you know? Yep. So um, I kept doing that and I was in that stage where you just like eat and do whatever you have to do, like work wise and you eat and then you like watch videos. And I, I discovered YouTube. Yeah. For time you know and so this is like 2012 and i saw matt ogus mm -hmm. um, and i saw his videos and i was like obsessed with his vlogs watch the whole because that was his first like matt versus mayhem or no mm -hmm. it was just matt versus or something i don't know what it was but it was a whole thing um and i watched like all bajillions episodes and he talked about eric and then 3dmj or whatever and then i went and found them and watched every freaking video that I ever put out by 2012 yeah. Um, and then I started making my own videos for whatever reason. Um, I, st I started making my own YouTube videos. And Matt found out who I was. Um, and I became friends with Matt, like, via the internet. Like, I was one oh. of the YouTube girls now or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, I became with, friends with Matt, friends with Chris Lovato. And I remember Chris mm -hmm. Lovato was coached by Alberto. And I remember talking to them on the phone and being like, okay, I want to compete again and I want to be coached by Alberto or by 3DMJ, but he would be like my dream coach. Yeah. And they had no idea who I was. Uh, but at this time, like, you know, like I said, I'd started YouTubing. I would like, when I'd share it, because Facebook was the thing, it was before Instagram. When I'd share my videos on Facebook, I'd like tag 3D and be like, hey, thanks for teaching me or whatever. Yeah. And they would like, <laughs> like it or be like, yeah, hey, whatever. So like they knew I was alive, but uh, mm -hmm. that's all they knew. And I, and I remember... <laughs> Uh, Chris Lovato, I was I was telling him about how bad I wanted to be coached by Berto, and I got this text from him, and he was like, "Hey, I'm at dinner with Berto. He said he'd coach you." And I was like, Ugh. "Like what? No." Um, <laughs> I know. Until then, like I, I, I uh, Facebook messaged Berto. I was like, "Hey, Chris Lovato told me that you said you'd coach me. I know you're always full. If he's like lying or that's not true, it's okay. But if it is, like, let's do it or whatever." I was such an idiot. Um, you were a fan girl. And then, oh, yeah, and then he, he like, called me back. He's like, yeah, just sign up. It's whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, like, because I get all, you know, because I was, like, obsessed with it, and then I now have this YouTube channel that, like, kind of sort of was taken off. Um, and I, I wasn't in school anymore, so I was like, well, I want to live by my coach, so I'm just going to move there, like, to Northern California for my next Oh, prep. wow. Yeah, so I was living in Oklahoma, um, and then I knew if Berto said he would coach me, um, then that's what I wanted to do. So I, when I graduated or whatever, I, knowing that it was like almost the holidays, so I moved back home to Texas with my family, like to live with my dad for like three months to try to save whatever I could, coach some more gymnastics, and then that's what I did. In January 2013, I moved to California and wow. trained with um, Matt and Alberto and my now like boyfriend of five years, Brandon Wells. So we all trained together, and that's how I met 3D. And then, um, of course, well, at the time, everybody lived there. Eric had just moved to New Zealand, but Berto still lived there. And then Jeff and Brad were an hour in each direction. And then 
Matt still lived there. August, right? We we were just like we're all there. Um, and it was like this weird, like magical year or two where like everybody trained together. Everybody went to all the shows. So I met the 3D guys at random shows. I still had my YouTube channel that was going, and then obviously blew up a little more because I was with Matt all the time. Sure. That's how that stuff works. Um, right. And then I would inter- I'd get to like interview Bert and interview Jeff and like mm-hmm. whatever. So it was it was real cool. Um, and then. Okay, how do I get a coach though? Okay, so that's how I met them. And so on the side, I have my own thing. I'm trying to build and like survive and make some kind of living so that I can keep doing what I'm doing um, since I, that was my only job at the point. Actually, I tried to get a job at a casino for a little bit in Northern California, but I couldn't squat because I had to walk in heels all day, so I quit. <laughs> so I, had to, I was like, okay, I have to figure out the internet. I have to figure out the internet and then um, so I can keep doing this or whatever. And I had my own website and blog at that time. I had my own YouTube channel like 10 to 15,000 subscribers. It wasn't like crazy like everyone else's. But um, I started writing ebooks, like basically taking the shit that I knew and putting it on a Word document and selling that and then like selling shirts or whatever. And it was doing okay. Like I could make rent barely. Um, and then one of the ebooks that I did was like uh, how to get ready for your first show. Not like the macros and all that stuff, but it's called Beyond the Build, how to prepare for your first Vegas show. And it was like where to get a suit, how to get a tan, Oh, cool. Out of pose, like stuff like that. It was like all this other stuff. And it did pretty well. Um, and one of the comments that I got from some of the people I asked to share it, including like 3D shared it because they're like my friends at this point. I was like, hey, I made this thing, you know, would y'all? And they like send it to their audience and it, it did okay. And then a few people, including Birdo, were like, hey, you should do this for guys. And I'm like, but I'm not a guy. So when it comes to like posing, like like we were talking about before the call, like yeah. I was gonna, what boy is going to buy a book from a girl about – uh, how to get ready for their bodybuilding show. Right, right. So um, the best poser, posing and bodybuilding that I knew was Jeff. And so I said, Jeff, can I put you on the front of this book and can you do the posing section and I'll split the profits with you. Um, and he did. And not only did he do it a little, like he got real Jeff OCD and it's like amazing. It's a, now that content is a course in the 3DMJ vault. Yeah. That was from the ebook. But um, yeah, so we did it for guys. So that, that went, well, that was like our first like, together halfway thing you know yeah but at the time the guys were just coaching um and this was the first thing that they had done outside of that like outside of only coaching dollars for hours you know right so it was really like a business thing how i became a 3d coach not like because i'm like this amazing coach or whatever not that that they wouldn't hire me if they didn't think i was good but it it, that was kind of like the the hole that they had was like i knew how to work the internet a little bit better and they were so busy coaching um and so that was like an introduction to like, oh, y'all could do other stuff, you know? And I'm sitting here thinking like, I don't want to compete in figure anymore, which we can talk about later if you want. But I was like, I know I need to have a long extended off season. I can't do this every year. It's stressing me out. I don't like being on the internet anymore. I was getting worried out by that. Um, like it, it was like a weird emotional toll of like gaining weight in, in the public eye and not looking yeah, at you when you started sure, getting famous, sure. you know? So I was like this whole... I don't really like being famous. These guys are really famous. I know how to work the internet. They don't, they're kind of, their content had slowed down a lot because they were so busy coaching. Right. They had blown up so much, you know? So it was like, they weren't making as much content. I knew how to make content. They were only coaching, but I was like, you can't coach forever. Like there's these other things y'all can do. Um, so it was like kind of starting to see that. Um, like I would help them with poses in clinics who didn't have a girl. Um, so it was like a, a little bit of things that were overlapping there. And then when that, when that, uh, that ebook, was done, I was like, what's the most important thing that I could do next? Using my skills, but I don't want to be famous really anymore. So like, what do I do? And that actually is when I approached Eric about making the muscle and strength pyramids into a book. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, this is going on so long, so sorry. That was (laughs) 2015. Okay, three years. It was like the end of 2014 or the beginning of 2015-ish. And I was like, hey, I know you don't know me, Eric. Like, we met, like, once. I was like, okay. but but Jeff kind of put in the good word. He's like, hey, she knows what she's doing. She's, you know, um, this is how it worked out with this other thing. Let her help you with this or whatever. And so, anyway, so I we were at a posing clinic that I was teaching with Jeff and Brad. And I was like, I want to do this thing with Eric's pyramids. They're amazing. I think that should be, like, a, a textbook, you know. Do you think he'll be down with it? And they're like, you can just ask him. It'll be fine. And I was like, <laughs> so nervous. I was so nervous. And so, as I think y'all know, like, that went really well, <laughs> the muscle and strength pyramids. Um, 
and then it was kind of like I'd proven myself as like someone who could do these things that they hadn't yet figured out. Um, someone who was really invested in the team. They'd done so much for me before leading up yeah, to it. Yeah. And it was like we knew we kind of needed each other, but I could we couldn't like afford it yet. Like they mm -hmm. don't just have like with their coaching money, they couldn't just like pay my salary for me to just do that. So it was like yeah. Let's bring you on as a coach. We trust you. We know you know our methods. Obviously, you've written these books with us. Um, I, at this point, I'd known all of them for at least three years, mm -hmm. or something like that, but really well, Jeff, Brad, and Bert, because they were a lot closer um, in proximity to where I was when we lifted together. Bert mm -hmm. was like one of our homies all the time. So, right. Um, so then it was like the big proposal was like, okay. Let's bring her on as a let's we like all decide if we bring me on as a coach and I take some clients that'll financially support me till where we are now. It took us another three years to where I don't have right. to coach. I don't know if you know this, I don't coach anymore. I Eric was gonna ask about coaches. that. I actually as of a couple months ago, my last athlete like graduated away. So wow. some of my athletes went immediately. What did you say about Eric there? I didn't hear it. I think it cut out for a second. Uh I don't know what I said. Uh, if he does oh, coach or barely coach it. like he has a really oh, yeah. small now because um he had to dwindle it down when he was getting his phd but sure. it's also like he's like our, our science guy so he's right. um he's like along with me like we're kind of in charge of like marketing and he's mm -hmm. more in charge of like he got coaches education and keeping us in there so we have like roles now so it's not like yeah long time eight seven eight years 3dmj was four male coaches like these four right. coaches and then it went to five coaches till we could all figure this shit out right and now it's like head coaches head of science and like me head of ops or something like that. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I, there's a few of those things, you know, I, I've heard so much from 3DMJ, but I actually didn't know a lot of that. Um, okay. I felt like I just went on forever. So sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, uh, yeah. Interesting stuff. And then I know, cause one of the questions I was wondering is, as we talked a little bit before, I think a lot of guys are hesitant to be coached by a girl. <laughs> and so uh, was that something that you ran into? Was that an issue or, because I know you guys don't often let people choose, right? It's kind of like no, we you're don't. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and it's so funny. Like I was telling you, the like we're we're in a podcast break right now. Like every every ten episodes, we take four weeks off. But okay. the we're going to open next podcast season with with an episode like literally all about this. And um, personally, I have never felt. I had a lot of male athletes, and I never felt like they, for one second, were weirded out by it. Hmm. Um, and I, but, but I have the four guys like, right. Know, okay. Like the, the whatever. Right. So I do have a couple, like I'm, I'm pretty lucky in that, that I never had a male come across my applications that was like, mm, no, you know, um, I personally, I don't, but the whole podcast that we do talk about that's coming out in like three weeks or whatever is about, yeah. um, a lot of things with gender, but, but that is one of them that like, we don't really know any, like if I wasn't associated with the guys, would I just have males that are like, please prep me? Like probably not, you know? Yeah. I, I do think it's, it's a lot more rare. Like you said, I mean, even like for the people who I do help, you know, who I coach, it's, it's probably like half and half, um, like men and women, mm -hmm. but, and I've, I've, at least to my knowledge, never had a girl not want to be coached by me. Um, but I'm, I'm sure I can think of guys who wouldn't want to be coached by a girl, I guess just. I don't know if it's the stigma or whatever it is. And I, I think that's probably changing a little bit now. Um, yeah. But like, I mean, when I first had a coach back in high school, um, I didn't know of any female coaches. So that's yeah. part of it too. I think it just wasn't around as much then. Yeah. And, and what's weird too is like, we don't know what we're not aware of. Right. I think the, the girls that might be weirded out by being coached by a guy, just don't ever look for guys. Like I don't think right. so it's Cause that, that's the thing, right. Is the other weird circumstances with 3d, um, like, I, like you mentioned, we don't, if you're just putting an application, you get whoever is up. Yeah. <laughs> like we have a rotating, um, any one of the five coaches that is accepting athletes, like has their flag up is what we call it. Mm -hmm. And our admin knows, um, we go in order, like just down the line over and over okay. and over. So, um, and we, you know, we do that for a couple re mainly because it was like right now, like Eric is probably the most sought after well known mm -hmm. right because yeah. of his name and his education but he's not coaching <laughs> right. i mean he does have a couple athletes um but there, it's not like his his flag isn't up it's people that like, he's either coached before knows in person things like that right um so we we do have like weird special circumstances if you already know people or if you've already worked with them like i um 
but but if you're just applying, like it's whoever's up, and right, which makes sense because you're going to have people who you know there's going to be some favoritism towards you know like like you said, Eric is way more in the spotlight you could say than like Brad Loomis, and that doesn't mean but... he's a better coach and he's the first exactly. to say that. Yeah, and right. like we wouldn't, and like I said, it's like yeah, I was brought on primarily to fill a hole in in the business, but they wouldn't. I mean, we all know the guy. They wouldn't have me on if I wasn't qualified. Sure. Um, and I was. Um, you know, we, we, we work a lot together. Like, yes, it's five coaches, but we, we speak every two weeks about, like we have Eric talk to it. We all talk about coaching and we all talk about any athlete problems we have. And we all, so it's not like you're on like some Island with this one coach or whatever, like you right. want to have you personally accountable, but it was, it's things like that. Like the, we don't want to feed into the fallacy that like fame equals better. Right. And also um, it, when it's known like out, up front and out right it doesn't put it like a a weird uneven balance in the numbers like we don't want someone having a roster of like 80 and someone with a roster of 20 if they if they both sure. athletes or whatever um yeah and i think more than anything because we're so big on like our mission statement and the way we do things it's just not it's not a message we want to send out i guess um and people are surprised too like like if you like, I've I've had people that will be like, oh, I one of my friends said they worked with you, and they're like, no, I didn't know. Like they came onto my roster and they had no idea who any of us were. And they're like, oh, oh, this works out really well. And then they start listening to the podcast. And they're like, this is great. Yeah. So and that, that's good. That's good for us to hear. But um, yeah, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, that's how things. That's how things go. Uh, I don't know what you're gonna ask now. <laughs> well, kind of, kind of in the same line. Like I would have expected, maybe like some of the bikini girls would have specifically wanted to be coached yes. by you. Yes, I do get asked that, um, and I have to say, like, just put in an application. Um, I won't do that. Like I said, unless it's someone, like if one of my old athletes who's a female decide they want to come back on, that mm -hmm. that's different. then, yeah, no, I do get that a lot though. Um, and it's I would just, think it only matters when it comes to the as much really to like the posing. You know, like they might want a girl who's gone through it themselves. Yeah, yeah, but like bikini is very different than what I've done. Um, yeah. So I can, you know, figures. Bikini is a, a whole different posing uh, thing. But usually, you know, what the guys did before I came along, like you just refer out. And a lot of times, posing for those more subjective classes works better in person, anyways. So we'd be like, okay, where do you live? We know such and such, such and such might be good. Or we also um, know of a few coaches that do that via Skype, All right. like bikini coaching uh, or posing coaching via Skype. So it, it, there's always a, a workaround and there's a lot of things that we're really comfortable outsourcing if we're not the best for it. Um, yeah. Do you see a difference in, um, you know, one of the things I want to talk about that's obviously very prevalent in the sport is eating disorders and bad relationships with food, maybe not mm -hmm. full on eating disorders. Do you notice a higher prevalence in your female clientele? Um, like my my initial would be yes, but not really. It, it's pretty even because me and the guys have talked about this a lot, how the type of male that is attracted to physique sport a lot of times, just like females, gets in it to fix their fix the way they look. Yeah. Right. And so I think the admittance like someone saying i have this problem i feel fat i feel bloated i just want to look good and like whatever like i think it's verbalized more by females mm -hmm. but the issues if you know your athlete kind of go both ways yeah um just in my opinion just as often um like with again with males they won't use the same words necessarily uh like it and i've done this too because ugh, i'm such a dude sometimes but We'll, we'll say it as like, you know, I don't want to get too far from stage weight because I want to be in striking distance of next prep, but AKA yeah. like, I don't, I feel fat. Right, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, it'll, it'll be said differently, but I think more so than gender differences, it's like this sport just brings that up, you know? Um, yeah, I think, um, I think if you were looking at like the general population, it's certainly higher in women. Yeah, but, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. What once you like you said, once you get through the door of like physique competitions, we've I think made we're all it. a little uh, <laughs> a little crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Like we you know, and that's the thing that I like the way that I I perceive it and like the with all the things I've done, because I've done 
I've been some real dark places because of it, but it's like the, it's not just learning how to manipulate your body composition. It's learning how to be like lightweight crazy because that's what brings you to the stage and then learning mm. how to own crazy. Yeah. Um, I know there's better ways to say that, but it's like you have to learn to be obsessive. You have to learn to be ultra critical of your body. You have to learn to be ultra disciplined. You have to learn all these things that are markers of like you got a problem but you have to do it to mm -hmm. get to this stage and look the way you want to look. And it, it like creates this version of yourself that is not just physically unhealthy, but by all definitions of mental health, like really bad. Yeah. And, and I think the hardest part of our job is you have to teach them to be normal again after that. And so that's the greater challenge or whatever. Yeah. And, which I think even, you know, people, I mean, obviously you, you've coached tons of people and a lot of what I, the people I helped were friends at first. Um, and then, you know, formally taken on clients, you know, a little while back, but yeah. it, it's a huge part of it is like, how do you get them to mentally overcome those obstacles? Especially when like, I mean, I don't know about you, but like, I still personally deal with that at times, you know, when I'm maybe thinking I'm fatter than I should be or smaller than I should be or whatever. And yeah. I, I forget who I was just talking to about this, but I know like my brother, I think is a great example where when I was probably already five to six years into lifting. And so I was a lot bigger than he was at this point. And uh, he was like six feet tall, 130 pounds, like really skinny. Wow. But okay. he was, he thought he looked amazing. And he was like, my body is better than yours. Like all these things. And like really believed it. Uh -huh. And I got him into lifting and he looks way better now. He's got a pretty good build. And he's significantly less satisfied with his body now than he was oh, before because he's aware of it. You know, he's in my group yes. of friends and he sees it. And he's like, oh, what is this chub I've got here? Or, you know, why, are, why isn't my back bigger or whatever, you know? And yeah. it, I think it's just because you can become hyper-focused on these little things. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, another one of my, i say my favorite things. But things that like Kipes see come up a lot, right, is like when you, before bodybuilding, the, the bar you set was so much lower for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, once you know what 10 out of 10 shredded is right like, like maybe you started bodybuilding and you were athletic right and you you on some random ass scale you're like a five out of five in the way you look but you're like this is all right you know like mm -hmm. I, I look like i'm athletic ish then you get to like 10 out of 10 shredded and whatever and jacked then like no longer is a seven or eight acceptable in your head right yeah and it's just like bleh. yeah it sucks have you found a way for yourself to be able to cope with that or, and, and kind of not care as much or is it still something yeah, you I mean, it's to... a long time well it's it's like the whole i you say you like you care less and you're more okay but then like you're so much further along in your lifting career that you you do actually look better at the same weight than you did three years ago kind of thing right yeah um so like i'm the i would say like the the most self-hate <laughs> and like self-disgust i ever had was like maybe the first six months after my last show. Yeah. After uh, your last show. Yeah. So like oh, I, wow. I last competed in 2013 and it was with Berto and I got like, um, and he was my coach and he'll forever be my coach if I ever decide to prep again. But I, I did 2011, like I said, all crazy or whatever. I was really afraid to eat and still in that, like, I'm ready to get on the stage again. Like I know mm -hmm. whatever. So I was like 114 or 15 pounds on stage. I think 2011 got up to like one, like high one twenties. And I was like, this is it. We're going to stay here. Like no yeah. way am I getting too far. And then I was still living a real stupid life for like a couple years till I um, got with Birdo and we actually fed me a lot more without anything happening in my physique, like as, as like a pre-prep uh, mm -hmm. period together. And then we, and then we did my prep. So I looked, I looked a little better, uh, but I hadn't eaten in like three years. So then it was like, it's like I, I learned enough now through watching through DMJ, through being a part of the team, through, you know, like I knew, I knew I couldn't compete again. Like I knew it objectively. If I yeah. compete again, you're going to look the exact same. You need to gain weight. But damn it, if it wasn't like the worst thing. And again, I'm doing this all on the internet. So like I've, right. I've been doing <laughs> naked weekly check-ins on YouTube for however many months now. And when it has to go the other way, I was just like, oh shit. Yeah. So that was really hard. Um, and I think I got up to like 138 pounds. Like it was like 10 more pounds than between the other two preps. And I was like, you look like shit. And I did, to be honest, like compared mm. to now, like I didn't feel like it looked like I lifted. I had a lot of fat. Um, and 
of course, like anyone, if you saw me walk down the street, you'd be like, oh, she goes to the gym sometimes. <laughs> but that wasn't yeah. like what I was used to, you know. Um, and now, shit, I've been 145 pounds ish for the past two or three years, and I feel great. Um, I feel like and that's I, where you're at now. Yeah, that's where I've been for okay. actually. Um, barring injuries, I've been about between 142 to like 147 pounds for like three years straight. Um, okay. And I think maybe that, like, I it took me getting into a performance base, which you really haven't talked about, and that's a whole other thing. But for me to overcome the hating myself and feeling fat forever was for me to have to like one get off the internet mm-hmm. and like quit putting myself so openly on, on online without clothes on um and not like in a trashy way but like i was doing closing <laughs> jackets you know all the time yeah uh so like closing down my channel for for those purposes uh and become like a uh, caring more about skills and strength and like powerlifting wasn't enough so after i did like that time when i'm talking about how unhappy i was i was i was chasing powerlifting for a while yeah because because you hear how that works, right? You hear how a lot of people, uh, for a lot of people, switching from bodybuilding to powerlifting is a really good strength-focused thing to do, and it, it helps mm-hmm. them. But it just wasn't, I don't know if it's because of my gymnastics background, but it just felt like more of the same. I don't mm-hmm. know. Um, and I was purposefully not doing cardio because in my head I was like, cardio is wrong right now because you're trying to gain. But I've always yeah. loved activity and like, so I think it was just kind of a, a slump and like I'm not too stoked with the way I look. I know it's necessary, but I also I think was trying to set the example of what someone should do in an off season because I am a thought leader in this space. Yeah. To sure. the point of me not having fun and not having like activity other than like squat bench dead, like you know, like my whole twenty five years of life before that. Right. Um like never getting out of breath, never running, never flipping, never like all the things. So um, it took me getting into basically functional fitness, uh, learning the Olympic lifts, okay. allowing myself to flip around, swing around, muscle up, stand stands, all that stuff. And what's funny is even when I started that, like I got a coach, I went on like full on uh, the first six months. I even gained a little bit more weight, but I didn't give a shit anymore. Like I was having yeah. fun. And so then I've, I've settled back down. Um, to where I've been the past couple of years and, and that's kind of it. And now that I'm so far removed from it, I'd say I'm kind of like lightweight scared to ever bodybuild again. Right. Cause I like, cause lifting and playing with food is like super fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like I, I now looking back, I didn't realize how I was like slogging through lifts cause I had no energy. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not, it's almost like a, I don't know, like people think of it as just like something they need to do now, you know, to get a little trophy, like even like a metaphorical (laughs) trophy. But it's, uh, I don't know, I I feel like unless you're really into it, like you shouldn't feel like you need to do it. Like I've had people say like, you know, I want to get contest lean. It's like, why? Why do you, (laughs) a lot of people look, to to me at least, Mm -hmm. off stage, they look worse because, you know, I can think of a few people who they were 180, what I call beach lean is, is like a term I use a lot and they yeah. look great, but to get like really, really diced, they have to be like 155 or something. And maybe it looks good on stage, but you, you kind of look tiny. You yeah. look tiny. You're, you don't have energy. And I'm not trying to give people an excuse to not do it. If you want to do it, do it. But I'm just saying, don't feel like you need to do it because yeah. I mean, to me, even like under, I would say under like eight or 9%, I just, I feel so much worse. My sleep is horrible. I don't yeah. look any better. And like everybody who sees me tells me to stop. Like, are you sick? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, that it's is just... one of those things where I think the, the gender, unfortunately, like, like does play a role in mm-hmm. the, in the, like, I can't tell you how many athletes and fellow coaches or whatever after a prep when they were like, they're like, oh shit, my, I feel out of shirt now. Yeah, you know, and like that doesn't happen for a girl. Like we're usually pretty right. stoked we don't fill out our shirts. <laughs> yeah, but um, they're like, oh, I look like I lift in clothes now. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's yeah, like that, that those things that dudes tend to like, and that girls we don't get that experience really of like, oh, I'm filling out my jeans. It's like, no, no, we don't really want to do that. <laughs> right. The only reason I've because I I think on the whole fat loss is harder for women. The only yeah. reason I would say the process meant like on the whole I, I'd say it's harder for women, but. 
something that they can benefit from or that they get is that when, for most women, when they lose weight, they're not worried, like you said, about looking too small, you know, Um, it's just not a concern. You can kind of just lose fat and yeah, you might lose some muscle, but to, you know, 99% of people, you're just losing fat. As a guy, every little bit of muscle you lose is like, oh, you you stopped lifting this week? Like, yeah. So that, that's the only reason I think it's mentally harder (laughs) in, in that regard. Yeah, I agree. So I think um, like the psychology is really interesting to me, but as far as, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, getting into like the strength sport, powerlifting wasn't enough for you and, and kind of how your gymnastic background maybe played a role in that. I don't know. I, was, I just feel like I got to move all the time. Yeah. Well, I, I was wondering because you were doing stuff at such a young age and, um, you know, I was too with sports and then even, you know, I, I started, I remember like running four sports on my own when I was like eight or nine years old, just because I, I wanted to be better. Yeah. Um, and something that I think Mike Israel and I talked about was like habits and how like we just got into it at such a young age. Do you feel that because you were dedicated so young and really like working your ass off at such a young age, do you ever find it hard to relate to people who just complain about minimal exercise and, yeah. you know, yeah, you do. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I find it like, um, really hard to relate to any, not even, just complainers in general, really. But um, mm. I know we all complain to a certain extent. But yeah, and luckily with 3MJ, <laughs> like that was more of a problem I dealt with when I was a personal trainer mm-hmm. back in the day, day, you know, because with Gen Pop. But luckily, the people we have with 3D do, do enjoy lifting for the most part. I, I say for the most part because I'm trying to think now, there are a few people that you can tell, I guess what's, what's hard for me is like when you get someone, I'm like, oh, you're doing this to, because you don't know how to love yourself unless you look a certain way. Right. And that's hard. Um, but I can kind of relate, I guess, a little bit because of how crazy bodybuilding made me those few years. Um, but when, when it does come to people who, I guess in, in any realm that say they want something know the steps to get there and then bitch about the steps. I'm like, well, then mm. you don't want to do this, you know? And so that is, yeah. Me. yeah. Yeah. That was one of the hardest things for me helping people because I was like, why can't you just do this? Like you just told me you had this goal and you just did something contradictory to getting you to your goal. And so to me, I'm like, it doesn't make sense. But at least when I was starting to help people and I would get annoyed yeah. and I've realized that that's actually really common. Um, and that's yeah, probably- and there's always way more to that, right? And that, and I guess that's the thing that it, I used to be real bitter and shitty about that. Yeah. Like, like you said, like annoyed, like what, what's wrong with you? Like, why mm-hmm. isn't this, you said you wanted this and you're not doing this shit. So what, um, and while I, I can't say that always goes away, but I, I have learned and I think been around enough people and athletes and to know that. It, it, you know, it's just not that simple. It's not that simple. Like if, if someone is, you know, is busy, has kids, has, um, is depressed and up because of something else, you know, mm-hmm. um, just sometimes people just need help or ideas and it kind of, they can help themselves out. They just need help to get there. Some people really can't. It is annoying or don't want to. And it's very obvious. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of people I've seen overcome what I thought was like, oh, you just don't want it. But, but it's because they just needed more time or they needed to hear it a different way or they needed a different example or they needed to think about it differently. Because I think we've all been stupid about something in our lives. <laughs> right, right. You know, so I think just um, that might just be me growing up and like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it is the more people I'm exposed to. Maybe it's being a coach longer. Maybe it's working with the kids forever, knowing that like sometimes they have no idea why they can't do something, and mm-hmm. that that's real frustrating. Like, um, so there's a lot of opportunities I've had in my life that help me deal with that better. But my knee jerk almost is always very like I have no idea what you're talking about, so I have to try really hard yeah. um, and go through my like mental inventory of times and where I've seen this actually work out for people and all that stuff. But I do find it hard <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, I think. The way I kind of what helped me is so I find like genetics really interesting and, and like the study of genetics and, and all that. Um, and you know, we see somebody who 
in bodybuilding or powerlifting, and we realize they don't maybe have the best genetics. And we understand, you know, they could be working their ass off, but it, they just don't have it. And similarly, you know, these, uh, you know, conscientiousness is a genetic trait to some degree, and uh, one's determination and things like that. And so, and I mean, genetics and also your environment throughout your entire life and how you were brought up. And so just like, for us, that's just something like, maybe you don't have the best, you know, hypertrophic genetics, maybe you don't have the best, you know, motivational genetics or conscientiousness. And so it's not so easy for them. You know, it's almost like, like a Mr. Olympia competitor looking like, well, they must not go to the gym much because, you know, they're not huge. And, you know, we did this from such a young age, we might look and say, well, why don't you just do X, Y, Z? And it's really not that easy for a lot of people. And, and if you've had a, a habit of 20 years of not working out, it can take a, a huge push and a lot of, you know, help to get them to the point where it just becomes second nature. Yeah. And a lot of times they don't know. Um, I feel like a, a real common thing with gen pop is they think I'm either training 24 hours a day, giving everything I've got dieting or how to that, or I'm just not made for it and I suck and it's hard to that. When like a, I'm going to call her out. Like my mom's an example of this. Like she's diabetic, mm -hmm. she has a lot of health issues, but I'm like, She's like, I just can't go to the gym three days a week. I'm like, Mom, you just need to go like walk halfway down the block. Like, yeah. you need to get in and out of your chair a few times a day. Like that kind of stuff where it's like, their shit can seem so far, but it's like, I think it's our job as coaches. And what's what's hard to do sometimes is be like, think about where you are right now. Like, mm. and then it makes it not always, but sometimes it's like, the next the next baby step for them is actually really easy. They just look at the people that are like fifty steps ahead. Um, I don't know if that's relevant or not, but like, like you said, like someone who's like, maybe don't have the best genetics, but it's like, what else can we get from this? What can we get from today? Like, what's a win? Like, so I think just, I don't know, always remembering like it can be smaller and smaller and smaller. Like the next step can be very immediate and the thing you can focus on can be very immediate if it has to be. Um, but I still think upbringing, like it's so funny. So I don't know if it's upbringing or a lot of like what you're used to, like the nature versus nurture. Like, yeah, like when you said uh, it could be genetics about someone's conscientiousness or self-awareness or, or whatever, but also like if you're raised, like if you're raised in a family of obese people and you don't want to be obese, like, you know. Uh. Yeah, it's tough. I always, whenever I see, a, you know, an obese couple and a little kid, and oh, that yeah. kid's got like a big gulp or something. And I'm just like, man, this kid has no chance. Yeah. Like, it, it just sucks, you know, that yeah. there's not too much you can do there. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think, like I said um, in other ones, I'd like to kind of end on an actionable step. So let's, okay. um, you know, kind of like what we were talking about there with the, the psychology and, and getting into this. If somebody maybe has a that negative mindset where they're kind of getting into it from a, I mean, not completely self-hate, but, you know, they think if I do this, I'm going to feel better about themselves. How do you go, and you, you know, as a coach who's trained a lot of people like that, I'm sure you can kind of spot that. How do you go about trying to improve their mentality going forward so that they can maybe look at this as a positive thing for life and not a quick thing to make, you know, something better superficially? Yeah, well, what's hard and what I, I try to do, like we do Skypes with our athletes the first time, you know, and like the first time that we meet before we do our weekly check-ins. And you, like you said, you kind of pick it up pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, this, uh, some people that are excited and like, okay, I'm ready to go. Let's do this. Some people that are like, look, this is my last ditch effort. I've tried all these things, you know. Um, so I, rather than have advice, I think, you know, backwards, it's like, well, listening is the first thing so like I, I'm a talker obviously by nature but I really try to listen to the other shit they're saying so rather than being like oh I need I need this or that but if you I need this because my body because blah 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 but then you'll hear like they kind of hate their job their relationship kind of sucks they're so overwhelmed with their kids they're like this and that and I think a lot of times the what seems and what they think is a fitness issue is like oh this is how you live your life or these are like you can't handle your fitness right now because you have 15 other things real far out of place to give you the space to be able to address this. Yeah. Um, so might not be super intuitive, but a lot of times, um, 
my, my advice might be like, look elsewhere. Like, where are you? What are all the things that are that are in the way of you even beginning to address this fitness thing or or bodybuilding thing or whatever it is? Mm-hmm. But then also, um, kind of more of like, where are you winning right now? Like, okay, so what is going good? Why is it going good? Is it because you have people in your life that keep you accountable to that? Is it going good because you're excited about it? Is it going good because you get to do this by yourself and not with other people? Is it going good because maybe you do this in a class and not by yourself? Like, like if they can find out, you know, one or two pauses in their life and try to find some like, why, why is this going well for me? Why am I doing good at this? And then we try to use, or I, I try to think about like, okay, the behaviors and the, the emotions that they have toward this thing, how do I kind of mosey that on over to their fitness goals yeah. or whatever you know so like if if they do like group training maybe they shouldn't work with me like maybe it's like hey first maybe you, you need to figure out what class you need to do because if you can't even go to the gym but if you can have a buddy that goes with you to this spin class or mm. to this crossfit class or to this boot camp or whatever you need to do like uh, speaking gen pop wise i feel like that's a really useful thing um finding where you win and how do we kind of move that over. And then for, for bodybuilding, it's weirder because it, it's more, it tends to be more emotional, more psychological than I even feel real comfortable doing sometimes. Hmm. Um, and not, not that I won't like take someone on or whatever, but it's like, it, it usually is less, like that seems a little more obvious to me because with Gen Pop, you, you literally have, you can do anything in the world to get someone more, more in alignment with their goals. Yeah. Uh, especially if they're physique related, right? You don't have to maybe lift the way that we suggest you lift to look better. You don't maybe have to do cardio the way we say it. Like there's a lot of options. But for someone who's in bodybuilding, you can tell like, oh shoot, you're in here to fix you. Okay. So then it's more like, um, Jeff says a lot too, like we'll, we'll take you because you're going to do this anyways. Like if you're going to prep and we don't think it's a good idea, but you're going to just go find another coach. <laughs> Yeah, we'll keep you and do the best that we can. Um, and that tends to be more of like a a very long term job. Like every mm. week to week, what are we tearing down a little bit? What are we? Those people tend to need a lot of reminders about why the the report. I had a shitty week because blah, blah blah. Well, here's why I don't think it's a shitty week, athlete. Because we did this, this, and this, and that, and they'll come back. I feel fat. Da da da. Okay, I understand that you feel that way, but here are the reasons why you could be feeling that way um why it could not be true so it's like this i feel like with physique athletes it's like i'm so happy that we work the way we do in 3d with the weekly if they're competing or bi-weekly if they're off season or whatever with the ongoing check-ins because it's not it's not a simple fix it's more more like this deeply ingrained um like self-deprecating thing that you can't get yourself out of because a lot of times as you know it's very lonely like you can't go to work and be like, friend, I know I look way better than you and I've been lifting for five years, but I'm really <laughs> down on myself because I have this yeah. one inch of back fat. Like mm-hmm. nobody can relate to you <laughs> right. when when you've been really lean or when you've been chasing, you know, you've been lifting seriously or counting your macros forever and you don't really know how to, like we're, we're such a small community of specialized skills. Yeah. And with that, it's like when someone comes to us and it's how I felt when I started working with Berto too, and I found Matt online. It's like, oh shit, I'm not alone. There are other people. But mm. unless you live right by us or train with us or whatever, like like you reaching out to the forums, I'm sure was a real big help back in the day. It's like you just need people that understand what you're doing and you need them to assure not even assure you. Um, I mean kinda, right? It's like it's like we've talked about there's things that you know, but you you're in your own head and you need to have someone bounce these ideas off you and tell you you know, what to look for. So there, there's really right. no easy fix for, the, <laughs> for right, the, right. the bodybuilder. It's just like, it's a weirdly on go, like very long-term um, reminders of shit we already know to get you out of your own head kind of thing. It's very strange. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, that no, 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 that, that was a great closing point. And I, I think it makes cool. a lot of sense. I think people listening will kind of relate. Like you said, it, it, it is kind of hard. I, I say like the closest friends we meet are people we meet at the gym a lot of the time because you yeah. know like oh here's somebody who can actually relate to my kind of craziness you know so that's the thing it's our own special brand of crazy yep yeah. so uh everybody knows 3dmj.com or 3dmusclejourney.com right. um and you guys have the youtube as well you're andrea valdez on instagram right i think it's just your name i am yep uh, okay anywhere else people can find your stuff 
Uh, my stuff uh, at andrevaldez.com. I have my own website where I just like collect things that I've done, random things that I've done, articles, interviews, stuff like that. This will be on there when it comes out. Cool, cool. Uh, yeah, andrevaldez.com is all about me. But the team is 3dmusclejourney.com. Our courses are 3dmjvault.com. Okay, great. Thanks so much for talking. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you all for listening to my interview with Andrea Valdez. It was nice getting to hear a little bit more about her specific role in 3DMJ. If you liked the video, please go ahead and like it and subscribe to the channel. And if you like the charity idea that she had mentioned, please go ahead and make your own donation as well.